Debbie, okay. the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Susie. It's so great to be here. The first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to do it in this way that is going to show you that the slides are preparing. So it's going to just take a minute before it's all loading. And let's hope we did try this during tech. So here, we, okay, it's going, it's going. But may it, may it come all together. But it's such a pleasure uh, to be here with you as part of Jasmine Southwest Speaker Series. I'm really grateful to all the organizers, especially to Susie Wampler for this information, this uh, this chance to talk to you about my forthcoming book, Sister Novelist. Okay. So now you should see, if you have an on speaker view, you should see me and the slides as a background. You should not have to look two different places. It should be all in one if everything's going well. Uh, but again, so thank you, Susie. I also, since Claire Belanti joined after Susie thanked her, I want to just again, thank Claire and her late husband, Bob, for their underwriting of this virtual series and for making it possible. It's so great to so see so many familiar faces in the list of participants. One I wanna select out, I see Professor Anne Lore is here and her work has made mine possible. Her work inspired mine in graduate school and it just means so much to me that, uh, that she is here to see that this work that she inspired on the Porter sisters has now come to fruition. So hello, Anne, hello to all of the familiar faces uh, and let's, uh, let's jump in. So I'm just over the moon to let you know that uh, Sister Novelist got a starred review from Kirkus this week. And I am really thrilled to share this positive news with this group because some of you have been with me and this project uh, cheering it on and supporting it over these pandemic years and some of you for years before that too. I have really fond memories of being with all of you in person at in USC in December 2019. Um, doesn't that now feel like a million years ago? But I remember vividly all of us in that room with that amazing session that day. And I'm honored that you'd want to have me back virtually to talk to you this morning. Uh, that is, if you're in the Pacific time zone, uh, like I am here in boiling hot Arizona in the Pacific time zone this morning or whatever time of day it is for you uh, joining us via Zoom today. All right. So if you are saying, who in the world are the Porter sisters? <laughs> I've never even heard of them. Then rest assured you are not alone. You were not absent on that day in your English literature survey class if you took one. The reason you haven't heard of these once famous sisters is because the Porters eventually became so obscure that until quite recently, even most experts hadn't read their writings or in some cases hadn't heard of them. And again, this is you know excluding Anne Malore, who uh, you know, was one of the people who brought writers like the Porters to my attention. Yet the Mrs. Porter, as they were called, were once globally famous, although it's sometimes hard to convince people of that, I find. I know one way I can convince a group of book-loving Jainites is by showing you some beautiful 19th century copies of their books, uh, proving that readers once prized having gorgeous copies of their writings. And a lot of us Jainites, I think, have a healthy appreciation for a beautiful edition of Jane Austen's novels, right? So the Porter sisters and Jane Austen were actually all featured together in the pioneering standard novels illustrated editions of the early 1830s. The Porter sisters were some of the first that appeared in that standard novel series. So the Porters and the late Austen were literally found on a shelf together in the same series of classic books in that era. But I want to show you too that the Porter sisters had a similar stature to Jane Austen's in the late 19th century and that all of them attracted publishers who brought out their most famous novels in these illustrated editions with beautiful covers. And I wanna just show you a few of those. So I've been collecting some of them over the years and I'm in the process of, of building a website of, to, to show you some of these. It's from my new book, sisternovelist.com is the website. And I wanna give you a peek at that here, some of that content here. Oh, you could go there now and see larger images of any of these that I'm highlighting for yourselves. The website is still under construction as Susie mentioned, but I've got at least this part of the online exhibit going. So here are some of Jane Porter's Thaddeus of Warsaw editions from the late 19th century, three, so three or four decades after her death. And you can see from the bottom row that some of these editions were marketed to young American boys. Uh, Porter's book is about a, a war hero 
from the 1790s in war-torn Poland, which was then uh, in a battle for independence from Russia, but he becomes a penniless refugee in England. So Thaddeus of Warsaw has nothing to do with the American frontier or canoes or campsites, but you can see that it was sometimes marketed to boys and also to girls too, in the one in the upper right there. The novel has some terrific female characters, both uh, a, a chaste, uh, perfect heroine and a captivating femme fatale. I want to show you too some editions of Porter's other most famous novel, the best-selling The Scottish Chiefs from 1810. So the top row of editions there are very much going for the new woman reader of the late Victorian era. And this novel, which was about the late 13th century Scottish independence hero, William Wallace, also features a perfect heroine, a femme fatale, cross-dressing, murder, castles, imprisonment, and political intrigue. So some of these covers get at that better than others, uh, but it was Porter's longest lasting literary success. And you can see signs of that in these beautiful editions. But believe it or not, at one point in literary history, Jane Austen and Jane Porter could be mistaken for one another. At least that's one conclusion we might reach from this late 19th century title page with its printer's error. And you can see that there are boned it up for you too. The Scottish Chiefs is said to be by the author of Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility. So obviously someone uh, got confused at the printers or something got confused at the printers and confused enough that some copies of this volume were sold and circulated. Now, what it tells me is that as Jane Austen's literary star was gradually rising, Jane Porter's was gradually falling at some point in the late Victorian period. Now, I think literary history got it right to elevate Austen. I'm not sure, you know, no one in this group is going to argue with me over that. But I think it got it wrong to relegate Jane and Mariah Porter to oblivion. So many Janeites are well versed in this fact. Uh, the 18th and early 19th centuries in Britain not only saw what's called the rise of the novel, but also the rise of the woman novelist and the rise of the professional woman writer. Now, it's important to add the caveat that that word rise has become rightly fraught in recent years, because although the number of novels went up, as you can see from this chart, this era was no, by no means one of triumphant progress, right, whether we're talking about literature, history, or culture. Some parts of this historical moment don't deserve to be celebrated. They were not progressive and we should shy away from acknowledging when that's the case. Uh, the era that we Janeites now call Austin's is a formative period to study with significant literary and social transformation and an incredible body of texts to read and reread. Now, some things did improve during this era. It's well known that the late 18th and early 19th centuries was a vibrant area, era for the history of women's writings and the conditions were in many ways ripe for the fostering of literary genius from women, right? Women became well represented as authors in most genres of this era, particularly in prose fiction. And there were actually hundreds of British women writers publishing during this period, not just a handful, and still untold numbers were writing but not publishing. You know, among scholars, this fact is well known. But many Janeites uh, may not know it, even though we, some of us do from chapter five's defense of the novel in Northanger Abbey. Among students in the public, I think this often still comes as a surprise. And that's because the myth eventually took hold that the only female authors active or worth reading during this period were Jane Austen, Mary Shelley, and then in the Victorian heyday, the Bronte sisters. Uh, so here they are on this slide from left to right. So much data has emerged in recent years to bust this myth of the rarity of the women novelist. Yet the belief in their singularity, I think has become too deeply embedded. We need to dislodge it. Um, I think it will take not only new data, but repetition and new stories and reaching new audiences in order to dislodge it. I hope that my story, my book of the Porter sisters and sister novelists and the Porter's own uh, statements about their own careers will do their part to help bust this myth of there being only a handful of women writers active in this period. Now, truth telling, uh, historical reckoning and myth busting are having a moment now, even in literary history more generally. And I especially appreciate the goals of this book series from Blackwell Publishing, which I'm just pointing out to you if you haven't noticed it, 
seeking a wider readership interested in dismantling these long mistaken beliefs about literature, history, and culture. Um, the humanities titles published in the series so far tackle larger than life figures rather than little known ones and movements that a lot of readers may already care about. If you haven't taken a look at the Jane Austen 30 Myths book yet by Claudia Johnson and Clara Toot, it's really excellent and I recommend it. I don't I don't agree with every single line in it, but I love it. It's provocative. It makes me think. And I think there's just so much in there that they help, they help us re-see. So I've recently thought a lot about myth busting too and why it's so important. And especially when I was writing my last book, The Making of Jane Austen, seeing that book into the world confirmed for me how crucial it is that more of us seek out new ways, new places, and new media in which to bust myths. If we care about getting stories of the past told or retold in less partial, more socially just, and more accurate ways. Now, for instance, I hope my recent essays are doing their part to help the project of revisiting what we thought we knew about Austin, race, colonialism, and slavery. And I'm not talking about that subject directly in my prepared remarks this morning, but I would be happy to talk more about it during the Q&A and to hear your thoughts on ongoing work on diversity, equity, and inclusion in Jane Austen studies. So what's clear to me with all of this work is that it will take our talking about early 19th century writers other than Jane Austen to bust these myths, as well as our talking about her and her fiction differently. So the first half of my talk, I'm gonna focus on some more on some of these macro ways through big data that we're making sense of fiction from this era. And then the second half of the talk is on the micro part of it, the storytelling of the Porter sisters. I'll read you a short excerpt from the book's introduction. And then after that, I hope we'll have plenty of time for lively conversation. So this is a slide that's important to me. Uh, and I think, you know, I wanna start by saying it isn't a truth universally acknowledged, although it is actually true that enormous numbers of 19th century British women writers were disappeared from the literary canon from classrooms and from mass readerships by the middle of the 20th century. And this was the case not only for authors who were little known in their own day, but for those authors who were actually very successful and famous in their own day. Uh, Clifford Siskin, who was my dissertation director and somebody I also owe a great deal to, has famously called this process, the disappearing of women writers, has called this process the great forgetting. I think that's a fabulous, catchy, memorable, and apt phrase. And it comes from his 1998 book, The Work of Writing. It's a phrase that's been oft repeated in feminist literary recovery work ever since. A Siskin identifies a great forgetting that became what he called the great tradition. And that's invoking the name of F.R. Levis's influential 20th century book of canon formation and literary tradition. Siskin argues that the great forgetting resulted in the neglect of virtually every British woman writer in the period, 18, uh, period 1700 to 1830, who wasn't named Jane Austen, and we might add, and Anne Malore would have us add, who wasn't named Mary Shelley. Siskin writes of the great forgetting, this is a quote from him you'll see there on the slide, there is much remembering to be done, and we need to find out how we forgot. So more than 20 years after he published this book, both of these phrases and ideas, I think, continue to resonate. We still haven't done enough remembering, and we still don't know enough about how we forgot. Now, what we do know about the great forgetting is that it was an, a cumulative effect of all these little forgettings was eventually experienced not by one or two, but by dozens and even hundreds of novelists, especially women novelists. And some of these figures were both critically acclaimed and widely popular. Thanks to the pioneering work of many scholars, we know that there were about 3,000 novels published in Britain from the mid 18th to the early 19th century. And we might think that the work of uh, counting them up as part of what we could call the great remembering. I think we're still engaged in the great remembering. Trends pulled from that body of texts have emerged. For instance, we know that according to provisional data, 60% of novels published between the period 1770 and 1819 didn't carry the name of the author on their title page. So it's a majority, but it wasn't an imperative for a novel to be an anonymous. You know, a well-known epigram tells us that anonymous was a woman. But evidence also suggests that that picture isn't entirely 
uh, accurate either, that it's more complicated. Some authors chose an anonymity selectively, that is, they chose it for some books and not for others. There were also cases in which an author waited for a book to go through several editions for a clear sign of its staying power and success before publicly putting their name to it. So individual authors actually went in and out of anonymity. Jane Austen first published as by a lady and after that the author of her previous work. So she allowed us to track her and she identified herself by gender. So one gift of the past dozen years for those of us who research, teach and care about prose fiction of the early 19th century is this freely available database, British fiction, 1800 to 1829. And some of you, some of you have heard me tout this before. I think it's really fun to search around in, or maybe I just have a really warped idea of what's fun. But it allows you to run searches that can offer you a bird's eye view of one text and known details about its reception and circulation. And it also allows you to take the 30,000 foot view, whether of one year or a decade or all three decades. You can see the names of every known novel published in a given year, for instance, or you can see how many novels use the word Abbey or how many use the word castle in their titles. It just allows you to do really cool things. And what we could tell from this data is that in the early 19th century, although the novel was imagined as a female dominated genre, women were actually not the clear majority of published novelists in this period from what we can tell. There was in fact close to gender parity in the genre in the first decades of the 19th century. So then you can see that here. Between 1800 and 1819, the numerical advantage slightly favors men of those who can be identified. 300 identifiably male versus 295 identif identifiably female novelists, but it's close to half. And here's one further thing. I'm still in the weeds with these numbers. I hope you're with me here. Uh, one further thing that scholars have been able to deduce. Male and female novelists seem to have been publishing novels at different rates of productivity. Among those authors known to have published five or more novels in the early 19th century period, two thirds of them were women. And Anthony Mandel is the person whose work has shown us that. Of those novelists who published 10 or more titles, three quarters were women. That's what Mandel found. So prolific novelists skewed female in this period. Jane Austen died without becoming a high producer, a high volume producer of novels at, as it might be defined, but she joined that category posthumously. Anna Maria Porter, one of the sister novelists in my book, uh, earns her spot among the prolific women. Now things were in the process of changing dramatically at the time of Austen's death. By the 1920s, the production of novels uh, split further in favor of a clear majority of male novelists. That is, there were more men than women publishing novels. And it also, uh, we might say, Austen died at the very moment that the novel's authorship was beginning to skew more strongly masculine. 19th century novelists began to be more often imagined as male in this period. Yet there are still educated readers who mistakenly believe there were very few women writers or perhaps few published British women writers across the whole of the 19th century. The great forgetting led us to misremember not only individual women writers, but the vast proportion of these writers, uh, the vast number of these writers as a group. Okay, so scholars have been testing theories about why this happened. And one theory is that the early 19th century reviewers and critics themselves actually uh, advanced this theory, that the novel shifted from being understood as feminine to masculine as a genre because of the runaway success of Walter Scott. He published the anonymous historical novel Waverly in 1814, the same year as Mansfield Park. And I'm not sure how many people have read Waverly or read the Waverly novels uh, anymore. I'd be interested in hearing if some of you have tried or intend to, maybe the chat will tell us. Uh, but he went on to publish more than two dozen works of historical fiction known now as the Waverly novels after the name of that first one that he brought out anonymously. And when readers talk about Scott and the Waverly novels today, some of them still repeat the truism that Scott invented the historical novel. Uh, that statement deserves to be classified as a myth. And it certainly played a role, I think, in the great forgetting because it led to the idea that men were the most accomplished and most popular novelists. Now, by making Scott into the supposed originator of the historical novel, 
many innovative works of historical fiction and pioneering authors of his own day came to be erased. Uh, for one, there's Sophia Lee's The Recess from 1783, and even Jane Austen's mother's cousin, Cassandra Cook, published a historical novel at, that was called Battle Ridge, as I'm sure some of you know, and it was published in 1799, and it appeared under the gendered anonymity of by a lady of quality. I love that Jane Austen took the of quality part off, <laughs> even if that uh, by a lady she retained, and I wonder the extent to which family tradition might have led to that interesting question. However, I cannot recommend Battle Ridge to you. I have tried to teach it in a graduate class, and it was a bit of a complicated slog. Your results may vary, of course. But there is absolutely no one who got more ripped off by the myth of Sir Walter Scott as the originator of the historical novel than Jane Porter. And that's the myth that I'm currently most interested in busting, not only by saying it loudly anywhere I can, but by trying to find ways to tell the story of the Porter sisters' lives, careers, and literary achievements in terms that will resonate with readers today. The Porter sisters deserve to be part of the great remembering. Their story should further dislodge the myth of Scott's supposed invention of the historical novel. Ultimately, Jane Austen and Sir Walter Scott both benefited from the regendering of the novel that was underway in the great that was underway in the great forgetting in the early 19th century. But Jane and Anna Maria Porter were decimated by it. So if you care about Jane Austen, <laughs> you should care about, about that. If you care about the great forgetting, you should care. If you wonder what the costs of Sir Walter Scott's 19th century dominance and Jane Austen's posthumous fame were on the other contributors to the history of the novel, then you should care. If you want to understand the context that led to the androgynous pseudonyms and the literary success of the Brontes, then you should care. The gradual neglect of Jane and Anna Maria Porter is a compelling and sometimes tragic corollary to the story of the making, remembering, and mythologizing of Jane Austen. In undoing these myths, we'd not only be restoring Jane and Maria Porter to a place in literary history that they deserve, we'd also be giving ourselves opportunities to see Austen, Shelley, and the Brontes with greater color, fewer illusions, and more depth. So next, I'd like to give you a sense of why the Porters deserve to be remembered by reading an edited excerpt. In, this is from the opening of the book. So here we go. Miss Jane Porter and Miss Anna Maria Porter were the most famous sister novelists before the Brontes. In Regency era London, people went to great lengths to see these female curiosities who were hailed as literary wonders. The sisters, born in the tumultuous 1770s, were known as geniuses and beauties. They'd sat for models for famous painters. They'd traveled in the same circles as celebrity actors, poets, activists, publishers, and politicians. They hobnobbed with nobles and royalty. A Marquis, it was once said, a, pay, a, a Marquis, it was said, once paid to get a glimpse of the sisters. Yet few today have ever heard of the Porters. It's an injustice that they're either remembered as minor novelists or forgotten entirely. The Mrs. Porter deserve a place of prominence in literary history for their central roles in creating historical fiction as we know it. Sir Walter Scott is commonly given credit for that invention, but the Porters arrived before Scott came onto the field. It upset the sisters greatly that he never gave them credit for inspiring his method especially because they'd all known each other as children. For a time, however, it didn't matter that Scott didn't acknowledge his debt to the Porters. The world didn't need to be reminded that the Porter sisters were the true pioneers. It was perfectly well understood. The Porter sisters gained global fame, with Jane the more famous and Mariah, as she was called, the more prolific of the two. Jane's best-selling novel, the historic, best-selling historical novel, The Scottish Chiefs from 1810, was said to be Queen Victoria's favorite book. Across the Atlantic, it was President Andrew Jackson's favorite. Novelist William Thackeray, author of Vanity Fair, remembered The Scottish Chiefs as the first novel he'd read as a boy. He'd so cherished it that he said he couldn't read to the end of that dear, delightful book for crying because he thought finishing it would have been as sad as going back to school. Jane's earlier novel, A War-Torn Poland, 
Thaddeus of Warsaw from 1803 was also a literary phenomenon. Emily Dickinson's well-worn copies of both of Jane Porter's bestsellers have dozens of folded over page corners showing an intense engagement with the books. Fans told Jane they stayed up all night reading Thaddeus of Warsaw, losing themselves in its pages. Her signature books about history's underdog war heroes set in nations fighting off tyrants were considered to be so politically dangerous that they were banned by Napoleon. In the United States alone, Jane's novels sold more than a million copies by 1840. Until the end of her life, Jane Porter's novels were widely read, rarely out of print, and translated into many languages. After she died, her works lived on, although they were shortened and then relegated to children's literature. The Scottish Chief was abridged with illustrations by N.C. Wyeth in the 1920s. In the 1950s, it was featured as a classics illustrated comic book. Later still, Jane's novel served as the probable though uncredited source text for Mel Gibson's Academy Award winning film Braveheart from 1995. But by then, the name Jane Porter was best known as Tarzan's wife, and the original Jane Porter's less celebrated sister, Anna Maria Porter, was no more than a footnote. None of this was predictable. Neither the sisters' rapid rise to fame nor their gradual, unjust forgetting. The Porters came up in the world from what the late 18th century elite would have called nothing. Such girls born portionless had few prospects. The sisters' misfortunes were compounded when they became fatherless. Without male relatives to depend on, downwardly mobile single girls might hope to become seamstresses or with some education, governesses. If attractive and good with numbers, they might marry tradesmen. The world might have expected the Porter sisters to become wives of struggling medical men like their late father. But the Porters who loved reading books from an early age broke the mold. From a very early age, in fact, the sisters began to amuse each other with the products of their pen. They wrote long loving letters full of silly jokes and make-believe intrigue. They chose outlandish pseudonyms and scrawled playful postscripts to each other at the end of dutiful letters to their uneducated widowed mother. The Porter family's series of shabby rented hearths and homes were places that lit up their imaginations. When Mrs. Porter, their plain spoken mother, declared that their London lodg lodgings looked like a dog hole, Jane disagreed. She said it was the manner of a place that determined its elegance, not its size. The sisters imagined greater things and then almost wrote them into being. Armed with no more than a few years of charity school education, Jane and Mariah became each other's first audience. Together they built word worlds, took oaths of sincerity and expressed mutual admiration. One of the sisters' favorite words as, girl, as girls was blazing. In their letters, passions blazed, gossip blazed, bow blazed. Each sister told the other that her fiction blazed with genius. They decided against all prevailing advice to seek print. Female authorship in the early 19th century was fraught. Educated women weren't supposed to do anything for pay because it was said to tarnish femininity and jeopardize fragile middle-class standing. Although fame had been something the Porter sisters prized in their youth, it was financial necessity that compelled them to authorship. The Porter family's three chronically debt-saddled brothers offered little help to their widowed mother, mother and unmarried sisters, a dereliction of traditional masculine duty. The conventional way for the Porter sisters to secure their future would have been to marry well. But neither sister took a mercenary approach to love. They refused the prevailing idea that securing a well-off husband was a necessary business transaction. At the same time, they were boldly negotiating the sale of their own writings. The sisters published separately and together 26 books, including innovative historical novels that many 19th century readers worshiped. The sisters hadn't enjoyed a clear path to literary fame. At the beginning of their careers, anonymous reviewers repeatedly told them that they should give up novel writing 
and give up on having ambitions. Eventually, the sisters won over both the critics and the public. Their heart-rending, uplifting novels of love and war were seen as so true to life that it seemed impossible the sisters hadn't been on battlefields themselves. Their signature sensitive war, uh, signature sensitive male protagonists cried at home and battled abroad. These heroes married resilient, perfect women after having fought off desirous femme fatale. The stories involved deception, cross-dressing, madness, imprisonment, murder. These novels were meant to entertain, but also to lead readers into wanting to further study history. Most of all, the Porter's books were meant to inspire admirable, admirable behavior and good character. Their stories are sprawling and their characters well-drawn, the result of minute social observation and extensive historical research. These books were exceptionally important in their time. Skeptics criticized the Porter's novels as outlandish and probable tales that skewed historical truths. But the fact is that the Porter sisters' real lives were frequently outlandish and improbable. These stories have remained hidden in thousands of unpublished letters that reveal not only Jane and Mariah's genius as writers, but the overwhelming challenges that 19th century women writers faced in public and private. That these letters survive and that the secrets they contain can be pieced together for the first time is a wonder. Readers who love Jane Austen's novels often lament that the author's life remains a myth-laden mystery because most of her correspondence was apparently destroyed by her family in the years after her death in 1817. By contrast, the Porter sisters, who were Austen's exact contemporary, lovingly preserved their letters, confessing their private struggles and long sections of reported dialogue as if their lives were the stuff of plays or novels. Their letters proved a training ground, not only for lifelong sisterly love, but also for practicing the craft of novel writing. Jane and Mariah recorded scenes they witnessed and entire conversations they overheard to capture the adventures of their daily lives. Their letters became a storehouse from which to craft fiction. When Mariah wrote to Jane from Brighton about the way the moonlight shined on the ocean, Jane encouraged her to save the passage to insert in some future book. All such contemplations are as useful to us as they are delightful, Jane wrote, for they form the veins of gold from which we work our future fabrics in fairyland. The sisters shared everything with each other. With sisters who are together all day and generally all night, they cannot look or move without observation, Jane once wrote, describing her relationship with Mariah. Hardly a thought can pass in their minds, but must be seen to each other. Jane called herself the echo of her sister's feelings and sentiments. And Mariah boasted that no one who ever met my Jane lost sight of her again willingly. Mariah, the more impulsive younger sister, was a social being, lively and loquacious. Jane was called the more beautiful sister, tall with long auburn hair and striking features. She projected a graceful calm, calm placidity and great authority. Their opposite personalities might make them seem like real life precursors to Jane Austen's famed heroines, Eleanor and Marianne Dashwood of Sense of Sensibility. The Porter sisters' romantic adventures also frequently read like funhouse mirror versions of Austen's famous characters and plots. I want to add a little aside here now for Jane Knight specifically, which is Anna Mariah Porter had a Catherine Moreland-like experience in her life, and that's why I've given you the illustration of her there next to one of an illustration of Catherine Moreland. Uh, Mariah also had a Harriet Smith-like experience. She almost had an Anne Elliot-like experience, but most significantly, she had a Marianne Dashwood-like experience. And her sister Jane had an Eleanor Dashwood life experience. You know, I don't want to give you all of the uh, true to life plot spoilers. I want you to find them out in the book. Uh, so you'll have to, to read the biography for those details. But I think it's a case of life imitating as yet unpublished art, uh, which is maybe also a commentary on Jane Austen's fiction and its verisimilitude. Uh, but back to the excerpt. There's no question that the perfect heroes that the Mrs. Porters dreamed up in the pages of their books 
had an impact on the men that they imagined marrying. The Porter sisters had high ideals, but the men they fell for proved very wide of the mark. Both sisters fell hard, often for colorful, charis charismatic men leading double lives, in an era when a polite woman wasn't supposed to discover her own feelings for a man until he'd revealed his own. Nearly every major life decision the sisters made in the hopes that it would bring them requited love or domestic comfort did exactly the opposite. For the Porter sisters, it was a catch-22. While single, they needed to write to support themselves. They maximized profits by publishing under their own names. But pursuing literary careers made it less likely that they'd find the heroic husbands they desired. Extraordinary men were sometimes fascinated by bold intellectual women with public reputations, yet such men were encouraged to marry subservient, delicate, and unworldly helpmates. Ideally, these self-effacing innocents were also rich. Men's limiting beliefs about women carried over into the literary world. Female authors relied on fathers or brothers to sell writing to publishers, most of whom were male, because it was polite and expected. But the porters, without the benefit of effective help from a father or brother, unconventionally stepped into the role of literary agent, especially Jane. She got the best deals she could for herself and Mariah. The sisters took care of their own business, although, as Jane put it, men of business are not always at the command of our sex. The sisters used both stereotypically masculine and feminine traits in their negotiations. They felt they had to. Booksellers are like lovers, Jane once wrote to Mariah. We must be coyish if we would keep advantage. Mariah, too, understood the publishing game. At present, money is our aim, and everything that is fair and honest must be attempted to obtain it, she told Jane. With this philosophy and pressing economic need, Jane faithfully recopied and lightly edited Maria's, uh, Mariah's rapidly crafted works and painstakingly composed her own. The sisters worked so hard that they often wrote themselves sick. But what shines through in their long hidden life stories is their unshakable love for each other. Sisterhood proved their most significant enduring relationship. It provided Jane and Mariah with an alternative happy ending as each one encouraged the other to keep writing book after stunning book. It also led Jane who lived longer to preserve both her own and her beloved sister's letters. Two distinguished literary men once declared that Jane's private letters would put her on a par with 18th century literary greats like Jonathan Swift and Lady Mary Wortley Montagu. These male friends believed Miss Jane Porter would someday be ranked among the illustrious, fem illustrious females of her country if her letters were collected and published. So far, very few of them have been. One famous and wealthy friend, Thomas Hammersley, who served as banker to the Prince of Wales, told Jane that people would want to save her letters of such a mind like yours, as he put it. He predicted every paper which comes from you will be worth preserving. Of that opinion, Jane wrote to her sister, I could not smile at his hint. I, who would wish to have all of them burnt as soon as the receiver has read them. It's fortunate they weren't destroyed. By the end of their lives, the sisters had exchanged thousands of pages of brilliant observations and secret reports about their acquaintances and friends. They'd also written dozens of novels and plays and countless poems and essays. Jane and Mariah's brilliant literary careers helped transform the figure of the authoress into a more respectable and formidable type. Now, the obstacles that they faced in doing so were unintentionally captured in a single sentence from a male literary acquaintance. He wrote, I liked these two sisters exceedingly, although they were authoresses. The sisters recognized how cruelly limited their own options were in not having been born male. But my love, had you been born a man with your head and heart, what an ornament to society you would have been, Mariah once wrote to her sister. I love you more than ever, Jane. At her death, 
Jane Porter was called one of the most distinguished novelists Britain had produced. The pathbreaking experiences of the Porter sisters made possible the careers of Jane Austen, the Porter, the, the Brontes, George Eliot, until each of these followers outpaced the, the Porters in fame and reputation. The Porter sisters deserve to be recognized for all they inspired and achieved and blazing a trail for female authorship and historical fiction. Yet posterity may decide that their greatest masterpiece is their vast, uplifting, and heartrending correspondence filled with stories of literary intrigue, financial disasters, and many lovers, uh, at least lovers in the uh, larger sense of that term, many loves. In these letters, the Porter sisters describe it all in throbbing detail, giving it to us straight. What it was like to try to live and love as brilliant, accomplished, and cash-strapped women writers in the world of the 18th and early 19th centuries of Britain. The lives of these remarkable sisters may sometimes read like a novel, but it's a true blazing history. Okay, so that's the excerpt. I hope it leaves you wanting more. I'd like to end the formal part of this presentation with a couple of images that were at the forefront of my mind as I worked on this book. And I should say that I've been working on it. I didn't know it was a book when I first started writing about the Porter sisters. I was at the Huntington Library in 2004, so a long time ago, working with the Porter's letters for a book that I was doing on British women writers in old age. And I knew I was writing a chapter on Jane Porter, but I didn't know at that period that I would get bitten by the Porter bug as it were. Uh, but there've been a couple of images that were at the forefront of my mind as I decided to write a biography of these two sisters. Now this, as we all know, is the cottage, uh, Jane Austen's brother's Chawton estate, Chawton Cottage, where Jane Austen spent her last years of life. It's now a beautiful museum, of course, the Jane Austen's House Museum, and I'm betting some of you have been there, and those who haven't been there probably have it on their bucket list. Uh, it attracts tens of thousands of visitors a year who seek to walk in the footsteps and offer homage to the great Jane. Now, by contrast, these are the remains of the last home of another great Jane, Jane Porter's last home in Bristol's Portland Square, near where she and her sister Mariah were buried. Now the contrast between these two images couldn't be more striking and couldn't be less fair to the Porter sisters' legacy. Jane's last home wasn't even the house on the left, uh, that which has been on the English Heritage Building's at-risk register. Her last home was the one in the space behind that parked red car. The original home is gone. It was torn down long ago. Fortunately, however, many other remnants of the Porter's lives remain, as you've heard. Uh, this, for instance, is one repository's collection of Porter papers. This is the Porter papers at the University of Kansas' Spencer Library. There are two other collections almost as large as this one at the Huntington Library in San Marino, California, and at the Fortzheimer Collection at the New York Public Library. It's a stunning amount of life information about the Porter family. Um, and at KU, the collection not only includes letters, but also includes hair. Uh, and you might be able to make out there, it says, uh, Miss Jane Porter's hair, 1806, my own. So I wonder if we had a choice for Jane Austen, that we could have either the house at Chawton standing with its many splendid material objects rather than destroyed as for Jane Porter, in order to have Austin's body of destroyed letters back at the same number that we have for Jane Porter, which would we choose? I mean, for me, it's an obvious choice, but I think, I think it's, uh, which might you choose, I would ask. Uh, is it even a choice? Of course, there isn't really a choice to make, but with the incredible body of material that survives to doc document the Porter sisters' lives through unpublished letters, long hidden, but now spread across miles and continents, we have an opportunity to rebuild their legacy through another means. And I truly, truly hope that we do and that you'll join me to make that happen. So if you'd like to be kept abreast of the rollout for Sister Novelist, which comes out October 25th, 2022, have we already mentioned that 10 times already? Uh, then please connect with me on social media. You could subscribe to my free author newsletter on Substack. You could consider pre-ordering the book or ask your local library to do it. 
Uh, you could put sister novelists on your want to read list on Goodreads. You could follow me on BookBub. All these are things I know many of you know that, uh, that you do for authors or books that you want to follow. I'd be personally grateful for any way that you were willing to help get the word about, out about this book in the coming months. Uh, to bust myths of all kinds in this era and to make room for the lost and silenced voices, as well as for the once listened to but now forgotten brilliant women writing before and alongside Jane Austen, I think we need to stick together now. As the narrator of Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey puts it about the genre of the novel and the novelists who wrote, uh, wrote them, let us not desert one another. We are an injured body. I'd like to think that Austen would feel the same solidarity with the Porter sisters who paved the way. Thank you very much for listening to this, uh, especially the opening data rich section, which I know is uh, you know, often not the most um, compelling part of this, but I hope I've set the stage and give you a sense of what this book is about and why I care so much about it. And I hope you'll join me in caring. So I think we have plenty of time, if I'm not mistaken, for Q&A, and I look forward to that. So I'll turn things back over to Susie. Great. Um, thanks so much, Debbie. That was amazing. Um, we do have some really good questions. I'm going to start with one that came in a little, little bit later, um, since you just brought up the letters. Given the number of letters remaining from the Porter sisters, can we Janeites not take some comfort that having more letters um, remaining do not guarantee a better legacy? That is, in contrast, can we take comfort in the fact that, regarding the lack of remaining awesome letters? It's like the Porter sisters are now the great forgetting, um, but we had all these letters. But what is your thought on that? So could you do the first part of that one again? Sure. First part it's of the question. Like, sorry, I was, I was trying to stop my share and I wasn't paying 100% oh, attention. It's on me. It's like, um, so given the number of letters that remain from the Porter sisters, we have this massive you know, trove of letters and we don't have any, very many um, from the Austins. Uh, could we take some you know, comfort that that didn't disrupt uh, Austin's place in history. Yeah, I, I mean, I think absolutely. You could you could see that as a double-edged sword, right? I mean, I think we see this with Shakespeare too. Then in fact, having too little information <laughs> can be a positive and that it sets people's minds on fire, right? I think a lot of the myths about Jane Austen's life come out of mythologizing by her family uh, and by the public. So I think mythologizing and the, the fact that there is so little information might have helped Jane Austen. And maybe the Porters, if these letters had all been known sooner, it wouldn't have helped them. I mean, I, I think, so we can take solace in, in this, absolutely. Uh, but I think how literary history gets made, how su literary superstars get made <laughs> in one period or another is a really, um, really fascinating question. And maybe the having too little information helps more in some cases than having uh, you know, in the Porter sisters, you could say too much. I mean, I don't like to see it that way, <laughs> but one yeah. could say we've got too much for the Porters. Mm -hmm. It was a lot for one person to try to read. I will say that. Yes, an incredible amount of letters. Um, and you mentioned that there were no editions of the letters. This is another question. Are you working on an edition of letters or would you consider that? So not at this point. And the person who is, is a fabulous scholar at the University of Otago named Thomas McLean. And I have benefited so much from his work. Uh, he and I, you know, first met at that Huntington Library stint in 2004 and both learned we were working on the Porters. So he's done a fabulous edition of Thaddeus of Warsaw with Ruth Knezevich. So you can now get a modern edition of that text. And I believe he has been planning and is hoping to, you know, gain the time and the funding <laughs> to do a, a selected letters of Jane Porter. So the Huntington um, University of Kansas and New York, you said those are like the three main repositories where the letters are? Yes, and what's really exciting, and I'm, I'm really grateful to Arizona State University and to the New York Public Library, the Fortzheimer Collections letter Porter's papers have recently been digitized. So they are now freely available digitally. Um, it is, their collection is primarily letters to the Porter's but there's a lot of amazing stuff there. And I, if you like looking at unpublished manuscripts and old manuscripts online, and you know, again, I find this fun, but I realize this might not be everybody's idea of fun, but that is now possible to do thanks to the Fortzheimer collection of, and the amazing librarian there, Elizabeth Denlinger and Charles Carter have been amazing and you know, just so helpful in, in getting those 
letters available to the public and to me during a pandemic. The, the Arizona State agreed to digitize them so that I could <laughs> have, uh, have uh, the ability to finish uh, the book while the library was closed. I'm just, I'm so okay. grateful to ASU and to the New York Public Library. That's incredible. Another question relating to the letters, how did so many of them end up in the US? Yeah, so I do tell the story in the book. Uh, <laughs> What I would say, the, the, the short answer is that they were squirreled away by what we might now think of as a manuscript hoarder. He was a collector <laughs> and his heirs didn't manage to uh, negotiate a sale with the British Library for them to buy all these papers. So they were uh, auctioned off gradually over the course of many, many years. So that even a century after his death, they were still being auctioned off. I mean, that's insane, right? I mean, that's how many manuscripts this guy had. He was trying to collect every single manuscript that existed. That was his goal. Uh, but in his name was uh, Thomas Phillips or Thomas Phillips. So when they were final, when the Porter sisters number, and they were numbered, they were like, you know, number 10,000, 646 or whatever, when they, when these lots of the Porter papers finally came for sale from the Phillips collection, there weren't export controls in place in the same way. And people didn't care about the Porters and they were um, relatively affordable. So they were auctioned off by Sotheby's and purchased by these American libraries. And that's how a great number of them ended up here. There are Porter papers everywhere you could list in the UK too, but not by the thousands only by the dozens or hundreds, right? The University of Durham has a great collection, for instance, Durham University has a great Porter collection. Uh, the, it's been fun, traveling for this book has been fun and you know it was made difficult during the pandemic. So finishing it was under not ideal circumstances, but fortunately I had all these years of, of notes and all these great librarians who were so helpful to allow this to be completed during a strange, strange historical moment of our own. And you get to go to Italy for uh, a little bit of work on this book as well. We can talk about that a little bit. The, the Rockefeller Bellagio uh, Center, I got a, a short-term fellowship there that allows artists and writers and critics to spend a kind of uninterrupted month on a project. So I, I cut the book down pretty substantially during that month. It was a very painful thing to cut it, <laughs> uh, but to be able to do it in one of the most beautiful places in the world around these brilliant artists and writers uh, was, was just fabulous. Um, you also mentioned that some are available digitally and you talked about Thaddeus of Warsaw, the edition that's coming out. Um, what are what else is available and what's not yet available? So there's a great modern edition of the Scottish Chiefs that was published by Broadview Press and edited by Fiona Price. And that's been out maybe even 10 years now. Uh, I, I have taught it to undergrads. It is long. It, it was a five volume novel initially. And I think it's getting harder and harder to get my students to be willing to read long novels that long for a class. Maybe they'll pick up something that long, uh, you know, on their own. Uh, but it, it is available in a teaching edition. And I know Janeites are not afraid of long books, right? You're not afraid of long books. Uh, so you should absolutely uh, check out the Scottish Chiefs. Thaddeus of Warsaw is out. It's a, a little bit more expensive in paperback, I think, from the University of Edinburgh Press. And that came out maybe two years ago. Uh, so there are modern editions. The Juvenilia Press also has a collection of Anna Maria Porter's Artless Tales. And if you don't know the Juvenalia Press yet, you should, if, if, you're, if you've been at the JASNA AGM, then you've seen the table there. Juliet McMaster was the founder and it's now run by Christine Alexander out of the University of New South Wales in Australia. And they bring out childhood and teenage writings of famous authors. And they brought out a ton of Jane Austen's Juvenalia. But they also have one edition. It was edited by Leslie Peterson, Leslie Robinson, uh, Robertson, and a group of others of Anna Maria Porter's first published book, published when she was 14, and it's called Artless Tales. There was a second volume of Artless Tales, and I'm working with a group of students at ASU to put together an edition for Juvenalia Press of the second volume of Artless Tales. So I, I think, I hope, there will be more interest in bringing the Porter's writings back into modern editions. Was that what you asked, Susie? <laughs> or did I just take it in that direction because that's what I wanted to talk about? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think that's great. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, this, quick, this question, maybe you can just talk a little bit about this. Some, I was asking, Jane attempted many revisions of Thaddeus of Warsaw to make it more historical. Why did her effort to historical fiction not take hold? 
but she was kind of, you talk a little bit about that. She, they did, how would you describe her? You, she was the inventor of historical fiction, right? I mean, or it was an early. I, I would call her the inventor of uh, the modern method of historical fiction or historical mm -hmm. fiction as we know it, because of course you could say that Daniel Defoe's Journal of a Plague Year is a kind of work of historical fiction, and that's from you know the 1720s. Anytime we try to say something's the first, we're usually riding roughshod over a lot of other things to to argue that, right? But but Jane Porter had the first best-selling work of historical fiction in this kind of modern method, with a, a protagonist, a hero, and a heroine, and a plot. And you know, I, I do think she did a lot of the same kinds of things that Scott that Scott did in Waverly and, and his other books. Um, so that's just to be mealy mouth around that part of it, I guess a little bit, uh, I hope not too much, Susie. But the question, the person who asked the question has read Thaddeus of Warsaw Scholarship, which I love, and I don't know who you are, but I need to know who you are. Uh, and I, yes, she went back and revised almost from the first moment. Um, in 1804, she was in Bath, uh, Jane Porter was in Bath, the same time Jane Austen was living there. And the second edition was called for. And so she immediately started doing some little revisions on it. And there were opportunities for her to revise it throughout her life. And she added prefaces and appendices and different footnotes. Um, I think her, it wasn't just historical information that she added. She also tried to change a lot of her text for changing mores, changing morality, which was a pretty common thing to do for writers who'd been active in the early 19th century and then continued on into the Victorian era. We might think of, of Wordsworth, for instance, who, who rewrote a lot of different versions of his poems and changed them given different ways that he felt about the world and different standards in the world of what good writing and good morality was. Jane Porter was caught up in that same, um, same motivation to make her books, uh, you know, I think we would probably now see them as more conventional or more tame. <laughs> she tamed down, uh, tamped down some of the content from earlier. Um, okay, that answer was too long too. I'm sorry, I get so excited. No, no, no. <laughs> I get uh, so okay. excited. Uh, okay, here's an, here's an interesting question. Their brother was in the diplomatic, diplomatic corps and spent some time in Russia. He married a, a member of the Russian nobility and had a daughter. Jane was executor of his will. Are descendants of their brother's daughter alive? Do you know? And this person also mentioned the University of Durham, which you also mentioned. Um, a lot of family letters are there. Um, yeah. yeah, what do you know about the brother? Again, I need to know who this person is. Like, I, I love that you are already have the porters on your radar screen. Um, I didn't, I, when I chose this excerpt and decided what to talk about, I said, I'll leave the brothers out of it. The book absolutely has plenty about their most famous brother, Robert Kerr Porter, who was a famous artist and went on to become a a relatively renowned uh, diplomat and married a Russian princess, right? Which was supposed to be the making of the whole family. It didn't turn out that way. Again, lots more details about that in the book. But as was noted, there's one daughter, her name was Mary. Uh, she did not have children. So if there are any descendants of the Porter family, uh, she, her, she, her name became um, Kakine. If there are any descendants, they would be collateral descendants, not direct descendants from that branch through Mary. Uh, but there, there is, um, he, Robert Kerporty was buried in St. Petersburg in, uh, uh, there, and there's a, a grave marker that still exists. And for any of you who have Russian <laughs> or can do searches in Cyrillic, and I really tried, I tried very hard, uh, although I don't have those language skills. I believe there is someone on a blog uh, post about this grave marker who suggests uh, that she might be a collateral relative. But that is really in the weeds for that person. And I would love it if you followed it up and found out for me. <laughs> Sylvia Marks asked that because she has a lot of it. She, um, thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. <laughs> so, you and okay. I need to talk to Porter sometime over a, a cup of tea or, <laughs> or something or stronger. We have a lot of really interesting comments and um, questions in the chat. So I will show the chat as well with everybody afterward because there's a lot of good stuff in here. All right. Um, another question about the brother. Um, what that uh, Robert per, per Porter, I believe, what sort of relationship did the sisters have with, with him? Um, and was he supportive in any sense? What about the, and the other brothers too? What he said that they were kind of derelict and. Yeah. So this, 
this is this is tough stuff. I will tell you that this is tough stuff. Uh, Jane and Mariah were closest to their famous artist diplomat brother Robert Kerr Porter. They worshipped him. I would say they they felt that he was their only worthy brother. <laughs> But the kinds of things that they ended up doing for him, I would say, I am telling the story in a way that they might not be so thrilled about because it's not hero worship in, in the way that I think uh, they might wish the story were told. They loved him, they were very protective of him and they wouldn't want uh, the kinds of details that are in the book to come out, I suspect. But he cost them so much time and so much money through mistakes that he made uh, that I don't necessarily see him as an entirely um, positive character, I guess I would say. <laughs> I think he may have sometimes been um, well-meaning uh, and he certainly was the most devoted of the Porter sons, but Jane Porter spent countless hours and countless pounds and shillings and guineas trying to sort out his messes. And he was the best of the three brothers. Um, another question, this is about um, Scott. Scott was complimentary of Austin. Do we know if he read the Porters? So this is a tough question too. Uh, we know that he's had some snarky things to say about the Scottish chiefs. He said, um, you know, who would turn the Scottish chiefs into a Christian gentleman. He found, he found the ways that he'd been modernized and Christianized and changed in Jane Porter's books, um, not appropriately historical, I would say, is what Scott, Scott's main complaint was. But this was something that Jane Porter herself wanted to know. Had Scott read her books? Had he ever acknowledged they were childhood friends or at least acquaintances? Porters would have called him friends. He might have called them acquaintances. Uh, you know, they they knew each other, and yet he had never publicly acknowledged her Jane Porter's particularly impact. And so, there I have a chapter where I talk about a moment where she learned some gossip behind the scenes that Scott had been talking about her influence, and it was actually in front of the the prince who became the king, in front of King George the Fourth, and at Carlton House that she learned this conversation had taken place. So it was kind of spectacular. Mm -hmm. And learning that gossip really just changed the trajectory of her life in the 1820s and her way forward with Scott and whether Scott deserved the credit that, uh, that he got. So yes, there's a much longer answer to that too. Right. Uh, the next question is from Anne Malore. Um, congratulates you on a great talk and is eager to read the book. Um, to what extent did Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own contribute to the great forgetting, even among feminist critics, do you think? I, I do think it contributed. And I, Anne, I know your answer to this is going to be probably better than mine. But it, Margaret E. Zell's work, The Myth of Judas Shakespeare, which made sense of the ways that Woolf used the women's literary past to create stories is uh, is persuasive to me. And Marguerite Zell has an essay called The Myth of Judas Shakespeare, but she also wrote about this in writing women's literary history. So I haven't personally done this research myself, as I know Anne has done and Marguerite Zell has done, but I think you're absolutely right that Wolf, as much credit as we could give her for pointing out that, um, you know, the, the ways that sexism was operating, right, in literary history, created a new set of um, not as historical as they might be stories about women's writing in the past. Um, and again, Anne, I, I think, you know, if there's something that you want to tell us to, to read on this by yourself or by others, I think the, the group would absolutely benefit from that. Um, but as you know, this is a, a really crucial question. We are continually making our best attempts to rewrite the past. And it shouldn't be surprising that past attempts to write the past fell short. But, you know, it's still happening, certainly. Okay, this is a question related to the data rich section of your excellent presentation. Who is Mrs. Meek with 26 published titles or August um, LaFontaine with 23? Oh, Mrs. Meek is fascinating because she turns out to be uh, a member of the same family as Frances Burney. And this was only recently learned by a scholar. So uh, if, if you Google 
Meek and Bernie, this should come up. <laughs> if somebody tries it, it doesn't tell me. Uh, but this is an example of where we're just finally putting together a lot of these weird mysteries of the past. Scholars are putting them together and finding new answers. So that's one where in the past, I want to say five years ago or so, this was discovered that this was actually a, a member of a literary family that we know of through Austin's writings, right? There's that reference to Francis or Fanny Burney in chapter five of Northanger Abbey. We know that Burney was a novel that Austin loved very much. So there, these ties in these, um, these literary families are a lot more deep, I think, than we've realized. Fantastic. Okay, we, they keep coming in. <laughs> um, let's see. You mentioned diversity, equity, and inclusion in your intro. Are there references to people of color, colonized people, et cetera, in the works of the Porters? Yes, the answer to that is yes. Uh, there are, um, and they aren't necessarily the kinds of references that are fully formed that I think we would yeah. want, but. One second, let's see if we can. Um, whoever's, someone in the museum muted, did we get it done? Okay. No worries, no worries, it's all good. Okay. So there were definitely, um, when, Robert Kerr Porter was painting his famous panoramic paintings. He was assisted secretly by a number of painters and one of them we know was black. Uh, there were examples in the Porter family of hiring servants and there were definitely servants of color who were part of the family's circle. Uh, but I would say the most significant contact is that some of the brothers and some of the suitors of the porters had experiences in the West Indies and experiences with plantation slavery. She had family members who, uh, distant cousins who made money off of slavery and the slave trade. And this was very much a part of the conversation around the Porter sisters and the part of the people they knew. And where I think it is really compelling is in Artless Tales, that first 1793 version of, of stories of Anna Maria Porter at age 14, she has a subscribers list. And many of the subscribers on the list were from the West Indies and were slave owning. And many of the London subscribers were abolitionists, including Granville Sharp, one of the most famous abolitionists of the period. So their politics were in this period very much on the anti-slavery abolition side, but their family contexts were not. And you know, I try to make sense in the book of the ways that these ideas came into contact in their lives and in their writings. It's complicated, it's not always pretty, uh, but I did very much try to bring out these issues of uh, race, racism, um, slavery, colonialism, where they came up in the story, which was um, not infrequently. Can you talk a little bit, since we're on this topic, about your recent um, discoveries about Austin's brother? Somebody's saying, this. talk about my recent discoveries? About um, the year you're publishing about Austin's brother, you know, Charles and the... Um, yeah, so yeah. last year in May, I published a piece on Jane Austen's father and his connections to uh, colonialism, slavery, and the slave trade and made sense of some details there that hadn't been formerly known and refined some things that had been. And also about her brother, Henry, who in 1840, it had not been noticed, uh, participated in, was a delegate to an anti-slavery convention. And I tried to, in that May 2021 piece in the Times Literary Supplement, make sense of how a family in 1760 could go to having ties to, social ties um, and legal ties, although I don't think economic ties, to slaveholders, uh, the people who were benefiting from slave labor economically, to a very much publicly leader abolitionists in the 1840s. That piece tried to make sense of that. But we've known for a long time that Jane Austen's two naval brothers, Charles and Francis Austen, uh, were in the Navy doing what their job was at the time after 1807, which was to police the slave trade and to, uh, to capture ships and stop them from engaging in trafficking human beings. Uh, so the piece in the TLS last month was talking about Captain Charles Austin's experience in 1826, uh, coming upon and capturing a slave holding um, a slaver's ship 
and what happened in that story. And that hadn't previously been told, although some of you heard it at the AGM last year in Chicago, parts of it. And I think it really complicates our sense of what it means for somebody in, uh, in the military, for a white man in the military to be emancipating or liberating, uh, you know, I use those words in scare quotes, uh, uh, human beings who were attempted to being trafficked into, uh, into, into enslavement. It's, it's a hard thing to talk about and it's a complicated story. And it's at the same time shocking to me that we think we have every single detail about Jane Austen's life and her family's life, but we don't. There's still, I think, a lot more to discover. And I hope that this piece leads more people to ask different kinds of questions and find new kinds of information. Uh, this is another question way back to the Porter brothers, uh, Porter sisters' brother, uh, brothers. Uh, one question about another brother who was a reputable Bristol medical doctor. Is that right? How do all these people know this stuff, Susie? I'm like, I impressed. think that's Sylvia again. I think that must be Sylvia yeah, again. Sylvia. <laughs> so, Sylvia, I, I love that you are, you know, taking a deep dive in here. Yes. Yeah, so that last house, the the destroyed house, was actually the house of Jane Porter's brother, William Ogilvy Porter, who was a, a Bristol medical doctor, as you your question mentioned. And her relationship with him was pretty fraught. And I talk about that at length uh, in some of the chapters of the book, but they did have one literary collaboration that's known to literary history. William uh, ended up publishing a book called Sir Edward Seward's Narrative. And Jane was the only name on the title page and she was there as its editor, but the book was actually by him. So the two of them did end up having a literary collaboration, but I can tell you that he was definitely not her favorite brother and you can read the book to find out why. <laughs> right. um, someone's asked, and we'll do this a little bit later. I just wanted to let them know we're going to do the ask you to put up that last slide so give oh, them yeah. the, um, the uh, what did various I see? resources. So, here, let me uh, maybe I can put it in the chat. How about that? Yeah, that'd be great. I did see that question. So, let's see if I can do this here. Okay. Is that what it's being asked for? Yes. Okay. Fabulous. Got Thank that. So. Taken That's great. Okay. And then, um, Oh, the, another question about whether which AGM are you going to be plenary speaker? There's one coming up that you're, you're speaking. Uh, so I got to be plenary last year. So I, there, I, I don't believe I'm going to be attending the AGM this year in Victoria. I'm still not 100% sure, but uh, there are lots of things in flux. Uh, some of you know that my husband, George Justice, is in uh, on the board of directors for JASMA. So he, he is going to be at the meeting. We have a uh, lots of complications, family complications. I'm not sure if I'm going to get there, um, but I, I really hope that I do. And uh, if, if I'm if I'm not able to be there, I hope that you'll tell people about this book. It, I would love to see you all again. And it might not be this year. It might be next year. Um, we'll have to what? find another way to be in person with any luck, right? <laughs> are you going to do a book signing tour, do you think, now that things are getting a little less... Restrictive. So I, for a, a lot of us who have books coming out this year, I think our publishers are still not exactly sure what should be virtual, what should be in person. And I think everybody's still trying to figure this out a little bit. So I am trying to um, make plans at least to, as best we can with, um, with bookstores and with local JASNA groups. So if you have access to either one of those and think, <laughs> we would love to have her in person and it looks like we're going to be able to be in person please reach out to me i would love to hear about that um and i know my um i have a publicist now this is like this crazy business that i've not had um access to before but my it's my publicist who's handling my calendar this feels very exciting uh but also like i don't understand entirely how this works i'm just going to be honest with you <laughs> So I'm still learning. And I think a lot of us are pandemic learning. What do we want to be virtual for? What do we want to be in person for? How will we feel in October? Let's hope we we feel that we want to be in bookstores and in JASMA groups. Um, so, you know, if you have an idea for me, please do reach out. I'm absolutely open to that and, and would hope that, uh, you know, that a book tour uh, is, is something that is in process. That would be great. And what are you working on next? What else is on your, you must have something. Uh, so I, I do have another biography um, in mind and I'm not gonna, but I'm not gonna tell you about it. Cause I think a, a lot of us are worried when we're at the beginning of a project that either somebody else is gonna do it. 
or um, or, or we're going to sort of ruin our own mojo by telling. But I, I do have another women writers biographical subject in mind. But I think I'm I'm probably next going to I'll continue to do work on Austin, of course. I mentioned this uh, project on Anna Marie Porter's Artless Tales too. But I've been putting together materials to work on a very different book on um, the history of and the women of roller derby. And I think I think that might be the book I do. Is that going to be too weird? Are Jane Knight's going to follow me there or not? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't I know. I'll follow you in there. <laughs> Oh, oh, someone's recommending, have you considered doing a blog tour to promote your book? She's thinking the sites like- um, Great idea. Again, if, if you've got a favorite blogger, favorite influencer, or if you are that person and you want to reach out to me, I'm absolutely open to a blog tour. We have, a, we have at least one roller derby fan in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, did I, I think I cut all the, the burning questions. Does anybody have a question that I missed? If so, please either enter it really quickly now or um, you can raise your hand too. Yeah, and I haven't been monitoring the chat at all. Uh, just to, you know, to, too many bells and whistles to, uh, <laughs> to to manage or I'm not that clever. I don't know how these people do it when they're like on Facebook Live and reading off the chat and doing it all at once. I'm, you know, it, it, handling the slides in the talk was uh, was enough to keep, keep me um, unable mm -hmm. to to read the chat, but I look forward to going back and reading it. And if there is a, a, a burning question, I'd love to answer a burning question. I think you answered this, but this um, about the, the the Porter sisters business, they, they managed that themselves. They didn't, their brother, brother and father didn't do that for them. You talked a little bit about that already, right? So their father died when they were both very young. Um, and so he was not somebody who was able to be helpful to their literary careers. Although some of his letters survive and they describe his, his marriage to their mother, Mrs. Porter in just really moving, beautiful ways. And I did try to include some of their love story, at least a little of their love story in the book. Um, their father seems like he was just a remarkable, interesting man. He was engaged for five years to their mother before they married, presumably because they didn't have enough money uh, to, to get married. Um, but their their brother Robert Kerr Porter uh, should have been, should have been a little more helpful. I think he introduced them into society. He got them invitations, especially when his fame was greater than theirs, which it was for a time. He got them welcomed into some society circles, and especially to a circle of really talented, interesting, and often poor artists. So when I said the Porter sisters sat for famous models. Uh, it's set as models for famous painters. I mean, they knew Benjamin West, the famous historical painter who was, uh, you know, became the head of the Royal Academy. They, the Porters were uh, were known to Benjamin West. Um, Martin Archer Shee, who became uh, the uh, the president of the Royal Academy, came to their home when when they lived in those dog holes in London. So, Robert Kerr Porter connected them to a really fascinating and learned group of artists. The sisters seem to have found their own way into a group of editors, poets and public debaters. So they, they were just so amazingly well connected among really fascinating people in London of the 1790s and early 1800s. And their brother helped that for sure. Wonderful. Um, there was a question, um, some of these questions have been repeated here. Like, there was one really good one that I missed. Um, oh, you had the image of um, Mariah and Jane and these lovely illustrations. And Jane was looked like she was a nun and she had the cross. Can you talk a little bit about that? I am so glad that you brought that up. I, I almost stopped in the middle of mentioning it. And I thought, mm, not the right time. Uh, so she is pictured in that um, illustration as a lady canoness, and she was made um, a, a member of the order of uh, Saint Joachim of Wurttemberg, which her brother was also in the order. So she's not actually a nun, but she loved to wear veils. And in fact, these images, and there were several of images of her in dark lace veils and that one you saw where it's a, a almost nun like where people at the time were asking is she a papist <laughs> right there what's going on uh, but she was definitely very much a protestant very church of england and not um not at all uh, a, a nun but it does look very nun like one of the things i did in the book is i included another illustration by the same artist of sarah siddons the famous actress in a garb as Lady Macbeth. 
And if you look at Sarah Siddons and Jane Porter next to each other, you'll see that she was really working with a whole aesthetic of women in veils or nun-like portraits of women. There's also one of the famous feminist Mary Robinson that was just purchased by the Huntington Library. Uh, she was an actress as well as a writer of her in nuns' habits. And these were people who were well known to the Porters. So I think that that image looks odd to us now and it looks like she's trying to signal Catholicism but I think the the ways that that visual image signaled in the early 19th century are actually a lot wider than what we see now so no not a nun but yes wanted to be seen as 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 Christian and pious and as um memorialized polite um, are there any known photographs of the Porter sisters no, there, there, is a, there is a diary entry suggesting that Robert Kerr Porter, the brother, may have had his photograph taken. But to my knowledge, it does not survive in a, in a, in a, in a way that we have access to. Maybe it will turn up. Uh, I don't believe Jane Porter has, I don't know of any piece of writing where Jane Porter references having had that done. Uh, so I don't believe so. It's a great question. She mm -hmm. lived long enough, it was possible, yeah. but not to my this, knowledge the answer. This is not exactly a question, but it's interesting. It's like, um, just looking forward to reading the book and uh, understanding why Ivanhoe lived on, but the Scottish chiefs did not as much. So any part of yeah. that? <laughs> so the Scott, I mean, the funny thing about the Scottish chiefs is it, it kind of did live on, right? I mean, there was still that classics illustrated comic book in the 1950s and Ivanhoe and other works by Scott were in that same series. But I, I think a lot of, some of Scott's works made the transition to television and film and Porter's didn't. And that's, yeah. uh, you know, at least not until Mel Gibson and Braveheart. Right. So there's yeah. a period where she didn't jump to the new medium. And I think that hurt her to some degree. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, charting this out and telling the story, I've really been focused on the sisters' lives and less on comparing their afterlives to Scott's, but that's another mm -hmm. project that I think would really return, you know, re repay the effort and, and I hope there'll be more of. And maybe other people beat me to the punch or somebody else should do it. <laughs> so <laughs> please tell me if you discover things. <laughs> um, we have one more question, but what is the, do, do you cover in the book anything about like how Braveheart, you know, took from the Scottish chiefs. I mean, is that in, is that in the book too? You know, outside of these little mentions, not so much, uh, okay. because I, I'm really trying in the book to keep the focus on lives rather than afterlives. There's a little section mm -hmm. on the afterlives where I talk more about what happened to their manuscripts. Uh, mm -hmm. But a person who has done work on this is Graham Morton. It's G-R-A-E-M-E -E Morton, M-O-R-T-O-N. And he is, I think, the world's foremost ex uh, expert on Jane Porter and William Wallace and the Scottish Chiefs. And he's done excellent work that's taught me what I know about uh, how the Wallace legacy was filtered through Porter's works and then how it's come forward and up to Braveheart and beyond. Um, that's really interesting. Um... Oh, a question about any dramatizations for stage that you're aware of? Yes, the answer to that is yes. And I mentioned those a little bit. Uh, there weren't laws against somebody else doing your stuff. Uh, so there was there was a moment where the Scottish Chiefs was turned into a horse ballet. Um, <laughs> and I, I just love this idea that there was a, and there are lots of, you know, that answer to that could go on for ages. Uh, but both of the Porter sisters had their works dramatized by others. Um, both of them also wrote works for the stage. Uh, Mariah wrote mm -hmm. an opera and Jane Porter wrote a play. And I tell the stories of both of those, which were uh, difficult experiences in both cases, Jane's especially. Jane's attempt to write for the stage involved Edmund Keane and it was a disaster. And it, that is one of my favorite uh, and most difficult to stomach chapters of the book. Yeah. Keane did not do right by her. Edmund Keane did not do right by her. <laughs> Uh, uh, I think, I think we, anybody else, this is your last chance for today anyway. I see somebody asked about whether Austin read Porter and Porter read, uh, oh. the Porters definitely read Austin, they loved her works, and I talk about that in the book. 
they, re they refer to that. And they knew Charles Austin. The Porter sisters and Robert Kerr Porter knew Charles Austin and they wrote to each other. So there are definitely connections in the afterlife. I don't think they ever met in life, <laughs> in, Jane Por in Jane Austen's life. And Jane Austen has one reference to Anna Mariah's fiction in her letters. So we know she at least knew of them. I would be very surprised if she hadn't read them, but there's no extant record of what she thought other than this one reference. And were they in both at the same time? Learning. Sorry, what was that? Were they, in the, were they in both at the same time? Yes, yes. In 1804, when Jane Porter was there revising Scottish uh, Thaddeus of Warsaw, Jane Austen must have known of her and must have seen her there. Must have. It's just, she caused a stir. Jane Porter was the, you know, sort of the it girl of the literary scene for a time. And I, I mean, I often think what it was like for Jane Austen to watch this other famous Jane when her novel Susan hadn't been brought out by Crosby. And then she sees this, um, you know, for a time in the spring of 1804, this other Jane breeze into town and become the talk of the town. It must have been, it must have been something. It must have been really interesting. I wish we knew more. We know what Porter thought, <laughs> uh, but she doesn't ever say that she met uh, anyone from the Austin family. Well, I think um, we'll end it there. And with great thanks, Devaney, for all this time, this wonderful presentation and this wonderful book that awaits us all. So I, it just congratulations. means so much to me. Thank you for your interest in this. Uh, uh, look forward to continuing to be connected and uh, look forward to your ideas. If you have any for me, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Wonderful. If anybody wants to unmute to say thank you and goodbye, um, feel free. Okay. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye. Great presentation. That was great. Thank you, Devaney. Wonderful. Thank you, Devaney. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. And thanks everybody for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, Thank you. It was great to be here. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Bye bye.